luminary in the field. And what's interesting about the origin of species is that Darwin wrote this book with having very little to say about how species arise. So some argue that the origin of species should have been titled the origin of adaptations. That's really where Darwin focused. That is, he was really keen on describing how natural selection drives the origin of varieties through competition. So much so that there should be sort of a continuous process of varieties forming. And it was difficult for him to imagine how this continuous process of evolution, creating variety after variety, actually splits the varieties into two discrete groups of species that no longer interbreed. So he really, he really left that question to the future. Um, and if you sort of take an abbreviated walk through history with me here, let's consider what some of the history tells us. So Ivan Wallen is somebody who not many folks know in biology, and I'm trying to resurrect his name because I think he has uh, some important things to contribute, which is that he was one of the main proponents that mitochondria are in fact bacterial derived. In fact, he thought they were bacteria right off the bat. And he based that observation uh, from the fact that they divide by binary fission. And realizing that mitochondria were bacteria far before, let's say, the, the uh, Lynn Margulis, who typically gets credit for this in the 60s and 70s, um, I think is, is, is a big fact to, to resurrect. And he wasn't the only one. But what he did rationalize was that the bacteria, or these mitochondria, since they occur in all plant cells, and all animal cells, may represent some kind of building block of higher organisms. They may represent some kind of fundamental unit of evolutionary change. And this was occurring around a time when people were debating whether chromosomes in the nucleus or these elements in the cytoplasm were, were more important to evolutionary change and mutability. So he has this great quote. Uh, it is a rather startling proposal that bacteria, the organisms which are popularly associated with disease, may represent the fundamental factor in the origin of species. So he was taking a speculative leap here. Okay, will we go that far today? Uh, certainly not. Um, but I think it, it set up the stage in history where these were being debated. Um, so let's consider where Wallen ended up in the history of things. So right around the same time Wallen publishes his book, there's obviously a considerable amount of work going on in Drosophila. And H.J. Muller, ultimately publishes his radiation genetics work, that you can tr cause transmutability in Drosophila by radiating them. And these changes in the, in the organism and the flies map to genes. So suddenly, the building blocks of evolution, if you will, now get mapped to the chromosomes rather than to, let's say, the mitochondria in this case. And this sets up the foundation going forward. So, 10 years after Dubzansky published, uh, 10 years after Wallen publishes his book, Dubzansky publishes Genetics and the Origin of Species. This book forms the foundation for modern evolutionary genetics. It gives us a biological species concept. It gives us dubzansky muller incompatibilities. And ultimately, we don't know this book that well, but we do know Dubzansky's book. And I always like to remark that it's interesting that Dubzansky's title is awfully similar to Wallen's title. If you just replace the word symbionticism with genetics, you get the same title. One wonders whether Dubzansky was just you know, leveraging that title into his own book. OK. So let's march forward a few decades now. So now we're in the modern era of biology. In 1997, Coyne and Orr published a pretty famous study in speciation work. And they published this in evolution. And what they did is they took Drosophila species pairs and asked, how genetically distant are they? How, how much genetic divergence is there? And how much reproductive isolation is there between those two species? And what they were able to show is there's a nice positive correlation between the amount of genetic distance uh, relative to the amount of reproductive isolation, with zero being complete interbreeding and one being complete uh, or no interbreeding at all, the, essentially the species status. So this sets up the genetic foundation for studying speciation. That is, there's a timing aspect to the origin of species. And if there's this positive association between genetics and reproductive isolation, 
one can then use the tools of classical genetics to, to dissect the speciation genes, that is the genes that cause reproductive isolation. So let's go forward another decade and since then, this is uh, now in 2010, there's a review published by David Pressgraves and you know, he lists the, the extreme progress and the great progress that's been made in finding the genes that underlie reproductive isolation and therefore speciation. So this is just a, a review and it's across a diverse set of species from plants, yeast, uh, and, and flies, of course. So we've had a century-long focus on looking at the genetics of the origin of species. And it's been so extreme to some regards that we've forgotten that microbes are part of the story. And these are quotes from two prominent biologists. One is an evolutionary geneticist and one is in the symbiosis field that reflect almost the forgetfulness of the fact that we've gone so far to the extreme of looking at nuclear genetics to understand what a species is. So here's one quote. I know of very, very few cases in which endosymbionts cause speciation and a ton of cases in which changes in host genes do and in which those genes have been mapped. Secondly, I don't think we have any evidence yet that there has been speciation caused by microbes. I'm not willing to go that far yet. Now, to me, that was surprising because I've been studying this field for uh, several decades now. And to sort of see this, uh, these conceptions come up is a problem, right? Because we're not making the work that is currently out there um, uh, uh, vocal enough to, to, to spread through the community. Um, so that's why we've been publishing reviews and trying to get the word out there. And that's why I want to start the conversation with what is a species made of? And by and large, we all understand what a species is made of here. This is not a, an audience that we need to convince that a species is not only made of a nuclear genome, but it's also made up of its microbiome. There's some interesting parallels here. So a nuclear genome is made up of, of course, all the chromosomal genes, but also selfish DNA, transposons, sex chromosomes, meiotic drive. We should not envision the nuclear genome as this perfect set of chromosomes that's not collaborating or clashing in any different way than what hosts and microbes might do, for example. Secondly, the nuclear genome is not exactly an, uh, a perfectly stable entity. That is, it experiences both vertical transmission but also recombination. And recombination is a way that we break up disequilibria between genes. You can break up associations between genes. Similarly, in a microbiome, you can have vertical and horizontal transmission. The horizontal transmission tends to be the predominant mode at which we look at the inheritance of the microbiome. So this tends to set up a contrast between the microbiome and the nuclear genome. That is, that horizontal transmission sort of puts the microbiome extrinsic to the organism, whereas vertical transmission of the nuclear genome does not, of course. But yet there's a gradient here, right? There's recombination that shuffles the nuclear genes in an imperfect way, and horizontal transmission can be considered a similar force in shuffling hosts and microbes in a way. But also there can be disequilibria forming between hosts and microbes through any of these microbial entities. So if we take that more open-minded vision of what a species is made of and we start to intrinsically incorporate the microbiome and nuclear genome into what a species is made of, what new ways of thinking does that open up about the origin of species and can we resurrect the importance of the microbiome in driving speciation events? So I would also just like to uh, plug that I think our knowledge of vertical transmission of the microbiome is vastly underestimated. I think we have to delve much further into this before we claim that horizontal transmission is the major mode of, of acquisition. And that's just coming from work that's really new. In the human field, there's two ways in which vertical transmission could in theory occur, either externally or internally. The external transmission route is, you can imagine breast milk has uh, about 600 OTUs. Those are being transferred directly to the baby. So this is not vertical transmission within the egg, but it's still vertical transmission externally from mother to baby. Um, there's also other routes as well. Internal transmission, uh, there's, there's sort of a, uh, a controversial set of data now coming out, particularly around the placenta, where the placenta is believed to now have a microbiome, and that placental microbiome might seed the baby with its initial set of microbes before the baby is born. So now we're talking about the child, the unborn child actually having a microbiome. 
And this is just an example of what we don't know. And so, and, and then if you look at the, in a comparative way, what don't we know about vertical transmission? Finally, I like, to, uh, I like the study where there's a mouse that was, a pregnant mice was essentially fed a probiotic that was genetically labeled. And there was a control group where they did not feed the pregnant mice this genetically labeled probiotic. And when they take these pregnant mothers and do a sterile C-section and dissect the pups out, and then the pups have their first poop, the meconium, those mothers that were fed the genetically labeled probiotic produced babies through the sterile C-section that had the same bacteria in the meconium, whereas the control group did not. So that looks a lot like oral administration of a bacteria transmitted to the developing pup in utero. There's more to say about this, and I think it's an area that a lot of biologists have to focus on. Comparatively, we know that insects have dominated uh, vertical transmission of symbionts. And even in vertebrates, we're starting to see cases, mostly pathogenic at this point, of microbes being transmitted transovirally or in the egg yolk of these vertebrate animals. It's pretty amazing, even to me, because I didn't appreciate this, this uh, literature until we summarized it. OK, so getting back to the origin of species. <clears throat> this is Dubzansky and his uh, graduate students. OK, so Dubzansky's in the middle here. And you'll notice one particular individual. She's the only female that Dubzansky ever took into his group. And her name is Lee Ehrman. And Lee Ehrman, with Dubzansky, worked on a case of symbiotic speciation, if you will. In fact, she published a paper in 1971 called The Microorganismal Basis of Infectious Hybrid Marial Sterility in Drosophila polystorum. So these are subspecies, or I would say geographic isolates of Drosophila polystorum. You cross them, and you get Haldane's rule, where the males suffer from hybrid male sterility. The females do not. And she, with Dubzansky, was able to show that you could antibiotically cure the hybrid male sterility. And she was able to show that the bacteria in the testes, which happened to be Wolbachia, of all things, uh, were causing the hybrid male sterility in the hybrids. All right? So even the foundation of evolutionary genetics uh, is, is, is warm to the idea of symbiotes and speciation. This young lady then comes along, uh, and this is a young Lynn Margulis. She advocated a strong role for symbiogenesis, that is the origin of new species through symbiosis. Lynn has the unique merit, I think, of advocating and bringing people into this realm, into this idea, but she didn't actually do any experiments on symbiosis and the origin of species. Um, so I think she set the, the sort of framework to be able to, to look at this and, and was brave enough to address it. So how then do we go about studying this in a practical way? So here's a conceptual model. Uh, you have a last common ancestor that has both a microbiome and a genome. And then over evolutionary time, these split into two separate lineages. They accumulate divergence. And ultimately, you end up with two separate species that have different microbiomes and genomes. Right? Microbiome 1, genome 1, microbiome 2, genome 2. And speciation would be complete once these things can no longer interbreed. So one of the canonical mechanisms of speciation is through pre-mating isolation, where let's say two species will no longer interbreed with each other. And in fact, there's already good cases where pre-mating isolation between species has been linked to the bacterial uh, uh, symbionts inside the animals. So these are two cases from flies. Um, <clears throat> the, Sh the Sharon et al. paper in PNAS 2010 uh, is a standout example that I'll talk more about. But also Wolfgang Miller's lab has shown that uh, Drosophila polystorum, uh, this is, continues to be an interesting case of symbiotic speciation, where if you remove the Wolbachia from parental Drosophila polystorum, they can no longer mate with each other. There's a reduced mating frequency. The other aspect of reproductive isolation is post-mating isolation. So here we're talking about the same kind of divergence events happening but when you come back together, you get hybrid inviability or hybrid sterility. All right. So we have been looking at this latter case through the model system, Nisonia. So this is a, a beautiful transmission or scanning electron micrograph, false colored, of course. Nisonia doesn't actually look like this. Um, and Nisonia are parasitoids. So working with Nisonia takes at least two organisms to work with. One are these uh, uh, sarcophagobulata flies. Now, these are large flies. Uh, 
flesh flies, carcass flies. Um, sometimes these flies occur at birds' nests as well. Ultimately, these flies will lay their offspring uh, in our lab on meat that we get from the meat packing company. It's not pretty business. Uh, these larvae will then develop into large sized maggots. The maggots will then pupate, and it's at this point that the nosonia come in and will parasitize this specific pupal stage of the fly. And the nosonia lay about 40 offspring in each host. So now inside the host, the, the, the eggs will look like this, just under the layer, but on top of the skin of the developing fly. And here's a developing larvae, pupa, and adult nosonia. The generation time is two weeks. Um, we have an incredible amount of genetic tools in Nisonia now. So not only do we have genetic tools, but we also have interspecific genetics. So this is obviously a movie. Uh, you'll see some uh, males and females mating with each other. I'll try and talk to you over this to give you some of the biology. I don't know if I can get your attention. But the Nisonia species that we're working with are Nisonia vitropenis, which diverged about a million years ago from the two more closely related species, Longicornis and Geralti. So Longicornis and Geralti diverged 400,000 years ago. We're going to call those the younger species. And then their ancestor diverged from Vitropenis about a million years ago. We're going to call that an older species comparison, younger and older. <clears throat> this is the geographic distribution. So Geralti is on the east coast, typically. Longicornis is on the west coast. And Vitropenis lives sympatrically with Geralti and Longicornis and throughout North America. We have, so what you're seeing here is copulation. So the female's been stimulated. She opens up her abdomen. The male backs up, copulates for a few seconds. And then he'll actually come back and do a courtship display, which is required in order for fertilization to occur. So within this animal model, we have great genetics. We have full genome sequences. Uh, we can do QTL analyses. We now have germ-free rearing. And these insects are easily maintained. They are used for a model system of speciation because these species are so closely related. In fact, if you take a canonical system like Drosophila melanogaster, it diverged from Drosophila simulans about 5 million years ago. So there's a lot of genetic divergence and reproductive isolation that could occur in that time frame. With Nisonia, we're getting into younger windows of evolutionary divergence and might allow us to study the key events that led to the, their speciation. OK. So culturing Nisonia takes a little bit more than working with two organisms. There's actually more. So Wolbachia is an, is an endosymbiont that infects 40% uh, of all arthropod species. And this is a Nisonia embryo. It's stained with two colors, blue for the mitotically dividing Nisonia chromosomes, and green down here for Wolbachia. So Wolbachia get transovarily transmitted every generation from the oocytes into the developing egg. This is the posterior end of the egg. And interestingly, Wolbachia are already in the, the area where the cells will develop for the reproductive tissue cells. It's as if they are queuing in on early developmental cues to get to the testes and ovaries. Um, this is a, an adult testy stained for red with Wolbachia and blue for host nuclear DNA. And then if you zoom in on these testes with transmission electron microscopy, you can see all these pinwheel structures, which are actually slices through the sperm tails. These are the flagellar axonemes of the sperm tails. And if you zoom in even further, you can see Wolbachia in the testes tissue matrix. This is a Wolbachia cell. It's about one micron in size. And then within Wolbachia, there's, a, there's also a bacteriophage that infects Wolbachia, which we've been working on as well. So studying Nisonia as an ecosystem, just by breeding it in the lab, we have viruses, Wolbachia, uh, Nisonia, and Sarcophaga all sort of going at the same time. All right. So it turns out Wolbachia is very famous for causing cytoplasmic incompatibility. It's a reproductive distortion in insects. And this distortion was documented in Nisonia as far back as 1968. They didn't know it was Wolbachia, and they didn't know it was infectiously based. But they were able to show that certain strains in the lab were unidirectional incompatible with certain other strains in the lab. That is, males from one strain were incompatible with females from another strain, but not reciprocally. This is some of the first documentation of what we now know to be Wolbachia-induced cytoplasmic incompatibility as far back as 1968 in Nisonia. 
So we've been working on this a little bit. And what we've done uh, many years ago now is to take the species of, of Nasonia, pretty much all of them, but in this case we'll focus on the older species pair and the younger species pair. The older species pair, Geralti and Vitropenis, when we cross them in the lab and we observe matings, um, what we see here is a complete reduction in hybrids. That is, there's no hybrids produced in the interspecific crosses uh, in comparison to the intraspecific controls. For both the older species pair and the younger species pair, we do get a little hybrid production here. Now, when we antibiotically cure them of their Wolbachia infections, the story dramatically changes. Hybrid production goes way up, almost completely uh, in this case, and actually even more hybrids are produced in this interspecific cross than in the control crosses. There's probably some hybrid vigor going on here. So what we see is the older species pair and the younger species pair are both strongly isolated by their symbiotic Wolbachia infections. Uh, why is this happening? Well, as I mentioned, Wolbachia caused this unidirectional or bidirectional incompatibility mechanism. So Wolbachia infect the reproductive tissues. This is the testes. Um, the Wolbachia are stained in green. The host DNA is stained in red. The embryos also have their own Wolbachia. And in cytoplasmic incompatibility, infected males crossed to uninfected females are incompatible, whereas the reciprocal cross and all self-crosses are compatible. So what is Wolbachia doing here? Why would it cause this one-way incompatibility? Well, it turns out that since Wolbachia is maternally transmitted, if you reduce the fitness of uninfected females, you impart a relative fitness increase to infected females. And so here, you notice that 66% of the offspring are Wolbachia infected, whereas in the parental generation, 50% of the offspring, or 50% of the individuals are Wolbachia infected. So every generation, Wolbachia renders the fitness of uninfected females low to increase its relative proportion in the next generation, and this can rapidly spread Wolbachia through host populations. So in Nisonia, there are, well, actually this is the cytological defect that Wolbachia causes to accomplish this. So the paternal genome comes in modified. The modification is expressed in the first mitosis. Now you can't see it in the late prophase, but you can start to see it in pro-metaphase, where the paternal chromatin doesn't condense as it would have to to go through the first mitosis. The maternal chromatin does. This persists through metaphase, maternal chromatin, paternal chromatin, and then ultimately at telophase, as the DNA and cell is dividing, the paternal chromatin is being shredded and split across these two cells. So this leads to an aneuploid and ultimately a dead embryo. So in bidirectional CI, different hosts with different strains of Wolbachia are reciprocally incompatible in both cross directions. And that's what we see in Nasonia. There are, in fact, different Wolbachia infections in each Nasonia species. So when you cross them reciprocally, you end up with this bidirectional incompatibility where Wolbachia is the only thing or the major thing that's causing the F1 hybrid incompatibility between these species. All right. So Nisonia is not the only case. We've, we've seen a number of other cases come on board in the last decade. Uh, John Janicki's lab has worked on mushroom feeding Drosophila. has put together a really great story on uh, sort of a combinatorial mechanism of symbionts and host genetics driving the origin of species. In this case, John went out and uh, sampled Drosophila subquinaria and Drosophila recens. So recens and subquinaria meet uh, right in your home country. Uh, and they form a hybrid zone. And in this hybrid zone, there's several types of isolation barriers that come together to operate to seal off gene flow or significantly reduce gene flow. So unidirectional CI is one of them. Drosophila recens is Wolbachia infected. Subquinaria is not. So recens males mate with uh, subquinaria females, reduced uh, numbers of offspring. Then subquinaria females discriminate against recens males probably as a selective mechanism to discriminate against males that they would be incompatible with. So they're not mating with these dead-end uh, males. And then finally, if hybrids are produced, the hybrids are, are sterile. They follow Haldane's rule. So this is a beautiful case where it takes symbionts and host genetics to get complete reproductive isolation. I believe this is a far more parsimonious model for the origin of species than to just focus on genetics and for that matter, to just focus on symbiosis. That is, this is going to be the norm, I think, if we ask the questions uh, 
what is the genetic basis and what is the symbiotic basis of the origin of species. So just to sum up the Nasonia example, we have two particular species we've looked at so far. The older species pair has genetic genetic divergence that's higher than the younger species pair. If we take this coin and or kind of model, there's an average progression of genetic divergence that's associated with reproductive isolation. These are where these two species would fall on the curves. When Nisonia comes into the younger species pair, because these younger species fully interbreed in the absence of Wolbachia, essentially what Wolbachia has done is pushed the reproductive isolation all the way to complete speciation. It's accelerated, if you will, the pace of speciation if we were just to follow this genetic model. And then in the older species pair, there's a significant amount of other reproductive isolation mechanisms that are there. And so it's difficult to say whether Wolbachia was causal or not in that speciation event because all of these other uh, reproductive isolation barriers occur, some of which we're going to focus on next. Okay, so Wolbachia is one symbiont that occurs in 40% of all arthropod species. And when we were thinking about trying to broaden the discussion of speciation by symbiosis, uh, it was at a time when the microbiome was taking off, and it occurred to us that the gut microbiome would be a more universal way of addressing speciation by symbiosis than just looking at Wolbachia, because Wolbachia is one bug, um, but every animal has a gut microbiome. So while insects represent the majority of animal species, only 40% of them probably have Wolbachia, so there's a large fraction of insects that don't, and obviously all these other animals have a gut microbiome. Okay, so what factors drive the assembly of the gut microbiome? In, in the Sharon et al. paper in, in PNAS in 2010, they took a single species or a single strain of Drosophila melanogaster and bred it on two different types of media. One was starch and one was a CMY media. And within one generation, although it persisted for up to 30 generations, those flies would no longer mate with each other or had a reduced mating capacity when you bring them back together. It was almost as if there was instantaneous pre-mating isolation when you split this stock into two media. And what they were able to show was that on those two different media, the gut microbiomes had changed. This diet clearly has an important fact in driving in the assembly of the microbiome. And they could swap the key microbial differences that occurred in those two diets to change the way they made it. Okay, so clearly diet's an important factor, but it's so important that it actually may drive the origin of reproductive isolation and therefore speciation. On the flip side of that, there's also a good evidence for host genetic interactions that guide the assembly of the microbiome. Um, so this is a classic case. Uh, I don't, this might be from something that you summarized, Margaret, I believe it is, okay. So this figure just shows up, uh, uh, summarizes a great study by John Rawls, published way back in 2006, which seems like eons ago for the microbiome field. But essentially, uh, if you take the microbiome of a mouse, put it into a zebrafish, and the microbiome of a zebrafish, and put it into a mouse, what do they do with that? Well, they tend to convert those interspecific microbiomes back into something like their resident microbiome. So it's as if the host is filtering out which microbes it, it can work with. Um, I don't want to anthropomorphize this, but clearly it's as if there's a host genetic interaction on the microbiome. All right, so both diet and host genetics guides the microbiome. How could these play a role in the origin of species? Well, let's consider two closely related species that are in a homeostatic balance between their gut microbiome and their host genome. Now, if you interbreed these two species and we see hybrid dysfunction or hybrid dysbiosis, what form may that actually take? Well, on one hand, it could be that the genome of two different species no longer work together, and so that genome fires a strong immune response for whatever dysfunctional reason, and this leads to an extreme shutdown or in shutdown in the microbes that colonize that particular host. So this is almost like an hybrid autoimmunity where the hybrid turns on its immune system and prevents good microbes from colonizing those particular individuals. And if you have an autoimmune response and in turn you lack those good microbes, you could have a symbiotically dysfunctional hybrid. 
On the other hand, the microbiome could become pathogenic in hybrids, and this is a form of hypervirulence or hybrid susceptibility, if you will, where now the pathogenic microbes take over this hybrid genome because it can't launch a proper immune response. These are just two of probably a myriad of ways in which you could imagine speciation via the gut microbiome occurring. And it doesn't have to be the gut, of course. It can be anywhere. Along these lines, we're also thinking about a way to think about how do changes in the microbiome occur over evolutionary time periods. And a number of labs have actually been thinking about this. Um, we propose the term phylosymbiosis as a metric for studying genome by microbiome interactions across origins of species or across divergence events. And I want to borrow a little bit of the ecological uh, concept of a neutral theory of ecology. So if you were to take different strains or species of animals and compare their nuclear genetic similarity to their microbiome similarity, um, a, a neutral theory of ecology or a stochastic assembly of the microbiome would hypothesize that there's no relationship between the microbiome and the genome similarities. That is, these are all just sort of randomly being acquired and there's no functional differences between them. Alternatively, you can imagine a more deterministic patterning of the microbiome where there's a positive correlation between microbiome uh, relationships as well as nuclear genetic relationships. And if this is the case, then we should see a phylogenetic patterning in which the nuclear phylogeny parallels the cluster community or hierarchical clustering relationships of the microbiome, which we call phylosymbiosis. Now, this is, we want to be careful here because we've seen these types of analyses from a coevolutionary perspective in the symbiont field. That is, if you take, let's say, aphid symbionts and compare their gene phylogenies to their aphids, you can see this kind of patterning. But those are two phylogenies. That's not what we're doing here. What we're doing here is comparing the nuclear phylogeny to the relationships of the microbiome. This is a total hierarchical clustering community analysis, okay? So it's much more higher order level patterning than just looking at gene phylogeny versus gene phylogeny. All right, so what are we assuming in this model? Well, we're assuming that the microbiota is mostly acquired from the environment. If it's vertically inherited, you may by de facto expect a correlation like this. Just by neutral evolution, you would expect similarities to cluster together as these genes and microbes get passed on vertically. But if they're acquired horizontally, there's nothing to expect that we should see this initially. In fact, under horizontal transmission, the null hypothesis is we should see sort of a random clustering of all this microbial diversity. Um, this is best evaluated in diet-controlled experiments. Why is that? Well, we know that diet affects the assembly of the microbiome. And if we're looking for a host genome by microbiome interaction, we should be doing these experiments under diet-controlled situations. That's not often done in the field. Uh, for practical reasons or not, many study systems will look at these kinds of relationships with respect to no controls. That is, geography will vary, diet will vary, host genetics will vary, and we often end up uh, concluding that all of these factors may or may not have an effect on the assembly of the microbiome. But if we can do this in the lab, where we control geography, we control diet, etc., and we still see these relationships, we can actually say something specific about the host genetic effect on the microbiome. Okay, so we propose phylosymbiosis because it's a metric similar to phylogenomics. That is, multiple genes gets us a, phylogen uh, a phylogeny from phylogenomics. Phylosymbiosis is all the symbionts giving us a pattern that might be similar. And this is statistically grounded. You can actually get a probability for getting this tree against all alternative trees. So we can have a statistical validation of the pattern. So in Nisonia, this is a, a cross-section of Nisonia stained for gamma proteobacteria. And the gamma proteobacteria tend to cluster in the hindgut at this particular early adult stage of Nisonia. Um, when you look at what types of bacteria colonize insects versus mammals, Nisonia is not unique. It's just like every other insect. That is, the gamma proteobacteria tend to be quite common in Drosophila, Apis, and other insects. Um, whereas in humans, the Firmicutes and Bacteroides tend to be the dominant uh, microbial phylum. So if you look at the microbial diversity across these three species of Nisonia, what we find is that phylosymbiosis is developmentally staged. So at each metamorphosis stage, Nisonia are acquiring different microbes that are distinct from the other stage. 
And if you ask how are those clustered, they're clustered in a phylosymbiotic manner at each developmental stage. So in the pupil stage, you'll see that Longicornis and Geralti have more closely related microbiomes to, than to Vitropenis. And the same thing occurs in adults. And this parallels the uh, phylogeny of Nasonia. OK. We can also ask whether this matters functionally. So we can take microbiomes from one species and put it into another species. And we've been doing this in the lab at the larval stage right now. And essentially, what we've done is we use Nisonia vitropenis as a common background and compare their larval sizes to germ-free Nisonia vitropenis. Um, Nisonia vitropenis inoculated with their resident microbiota, and then Nisonia vitropenis inoculated with the other species microbiota, Nisonia geralti. And over the initial four days of development, we see a strong increase in larval size that's significant for Nisonia vitropenis with its resident microbiota over its uh, germ-free or interspecific microbiota. Now, these experiments are done in germ-free rearing systems, so they're slightly artificial, but is the best we can do, uh, in which the Nisonia are reared on transwell plates uh, that are feeding off of media that have the microbiota no knocked into the media. Okay. So there's unlimited resources here. And so as you can see, over days five, six, and seven, there tar starts to be some kind of equilibration in the larval size. And we, we believe that's due to the fact that there's an unlimited amount of resources here. So letting the experiments run with unlimited resources catches up the slower developing uh, foreign microbiota in, in the Sonia vitropenis to the same larval size. Also, there's about a 10% uh, viability difference between the resident microbiota and the non-resident microbiota. That is, you get a fitness, relative fitness increase with your own resident microbiota compared to the other species microbiota. So there's 40 or 50 species between the two. Um, I would say 60% of them are shared just on presence. But when you start to look at uh, quantitative differences, the differences get more extreme. So it may be that both presence and, and the relative abundance of these two microbiome communities affects the impacts on these larval size and fitness. Yeah. Phylosymbiosis is, uh, is not unique to Nisonia. So Howard Ackman's group actually had the, one of the first papers on this topic in 2010. It's a good example of why diet controls matter in this work, I think. So Howard showed that the mitochondrial phylogeny of hominids uh, species parallels the microbiome phylogeny uh, or microbiome dendrogram of these hominids. But what was interesting to me is that you know, these are all collected in different geographies, and they all may have different diets. So when you look at, they actually show us the diet tree in their work, they did a chloroplast uh, uh, sequencing to look at the types of plant foods that these hominids might eat. And I was struck, although they argue there's not a strong diet effect, I was struck by the fact that um, if you look at humans, they tend to cluster in their diet. If you look at uh, the gorillas, the two orange species and two yellow species, they tend to cluster in their diet. Um, and then some of the uh, uh, chimpanzees also, the green ones here tend to cluster. It's really just these blue chimpanzee species that are dispersed throughout the, the, the plant diet tree in a sort of random way. But if you took those out, there's, there seems to be some significant diet signal, which is why I think when you do these experiments, it's difficult in nature to rule out what factors are driving the phylosymbiotic pattern. But if you do it under a diet controlled situation, it becomes clear. And of course, Tom's, Thomas's group has done this quite nicely, and it's diet controlled, geography controlled, environment controlled, and they were able to show the same thing. And this is, you know, I think an area for us to delve deeper into as well. How common and universal is phylosymbiosis under these diet controlled experiments? So this is obviously a beautiful Hydra movie going on here. All right, how universal is phylosymbiosis? So this is something we've started to work on in the lab. Uh, it's, this is hot off the press. My students got it to me this week. Uh, so the figures aren't perfect, but I'll be able to tell you a little bit of, uh, about the story here. So we've been looking at different animal genera. Uh, and in this case, we're looking at vertebrates. These are paramiscus deer mice. And the paramiscus deer mice are a model for studying the genetics of adaptation and speciation in North America in mammalian systems. 
Uh, what we've been doing is we, it turns out that the paramiscus have a stock center. They're all reared on the same diet. And we just uh, collaborated with them to get fecal pellets uh, to look at whether we see phyllosymbiosis under these diet controlled uh, uh, cages. And, and that's exactly what we see. So this is the paramiscus nuclear phylogeny. This is the microbiome uh, tree. And these are the top 100 OTUs, uh, just shows a relative heat map of their abundances. But there's complete concordance between the paramiscus nuclear phylogeny and the microbiota dendrogram. Um, another way to reflect this data is you can ask, well, what's the, what's the distance or the, the amount of differentiation between microbiomes within a particular species versus between a particular species? And let me first show you this principal component analysis here. So these colors correspond to the taxa or the species down here. And the colors show that we've sampled multiple individuals per species, so we can actually assay the amount of intraspecific variation in the microbiome relative to the interspecific variation between the species. And uh, ultimately, we can then calculate the amount of relative differentiation within a group to between group. And the intragroup variation is always significantly lower than the intergroup variation when you compare the microbiomes. Um, it's not exactly perfect either. There's certainly some overlap. But the clustering and the averages of those clusters are shown in these principal component analyses. Uh, we've also done this with mosquitoes. We've taken Anopheles, Aedes, Culex mosquitoes and asked the same question. We got these mosquitoes to our lab, reared them under the same diet to accomplish this. And roughly speaking, we see pretty good trends with the Anopheles phylogeny in the phylosymbiotic microbiome. Uh, same patterns emerge. Pretty good concordance between the two. Uh, Intra-group distances or differentiation in the microbiome is lower than intergroup. And this is the general principal component clustering. You're going to see the same story here, so I don't want to bore you. But Drosophila is not the same. So Drosophila is one case where we do not see phylosymbiosis. And it's almost as if it's the outlier. And it's funny to think of it that way, because it's such a model for host microbe interactions now. But when people have looked at Drosophila in the field and in the lab, they find a very unstable microbiome. It's really a wild variation that has been linked to diet but never to host genetics in a substantial way. So the fact that we don't see phylosymbiosis in Drosophila is consistent with the amount of variation that people have seen with this previously. Um, and also we've repeated this in Nisonia, but we've now added a fourth species, Nisonia oneida, and again we continue to see the strong phylosymbiotic pattern in Nisonia. Okay, so let's get back to reproductive isolation. So we see this co-cladogenesis pattern, and we have a classic case within this uh, two species, the older species pair, Duralti and Vitropenets, that produce what has been studied for 10 years now, a strong, almost a 90% death rate in the hybrid larvae. So these hybrids are dead. These hybrids live. Um, it has formed uh, uh, the basis of grants and papers to study what is the genetic basis of this particular phenotype. So what has been shown thus far is that you can map the QTL regions for the, uh, the genes that cause these particular inviabilities to one of, or actually four of the five chromosomes in Nisonia. Um, this is the convention, right? What is the genetic basis of reproductive isolation? What's not so convention, and if we just get more people to ask, I think we'll have a better sense of how important symbiosis is, is what is the symbiotic basis of reproductive isolation? There was no reason for us to look into this because Wolbachia was pretty much the story in Nisonia for how symbionts drive speciation. But when we found phylosymbiosis in Nisonia, and we found this hybrid inviability is linked to melanization, that darkening of the larvae, it sort of opened our eyes to, well, let's go ahead and pursue this, even though it had been studied from a genetic perspective. Uh, so this is the phylogeny of Nisonia. Um, during the larval stages now, we've sampled the microbiome. There's a phylosymbiotic pattern in the microbiome, so vitropenis is more divergent from Geralti and Longicornis. So these microbiomes now uh, are now looked at at the hybrids and the non-hybrids. So for the younger species, Longicornis and Geralti, their microbiomes are fairly similar, at least compared to the hybrids. So you'll see that longicornis Geralti hybrid microbiome looks a lot like the Longicornis-Longicornis microbiome. 
Now, interestingly, these hybrids do not die in the larval stage. This is a younger species pair. There's not enough genetic divergence, apparently, to drive the same trait that we see in Vitropenis and Geralti, where in Vitropenis and Geralti, the hybrids do die, and the hybrid microbiome looks distinct from the non-hybrid microbiomes. So we wondered whether this was causal or not. And there's a really sort of low-hanging fruit question here, which is if you take a conventionally reared hybrid Nasonia and you cure it of its uh, microbes and rear it under germ-free conditions, can you rescue these dead hybrids now to living hybrids? These genotypes that die could now be viable. And then if you put bacteria back into these hybrids, could you reinstate the conventional mortality that we typically see? So we did this with an in vitro rearing system. This is, again, another look at it, a transwell assay. Uh, we get good development from eggs to pupil stage. And this is key because, key because the larval mortality um, is observable in real time uh, in this assay. Now, typically, Nasonia develop inside a host. So we have no access to visualizing the developmental changes and counting the number of offspring. Outside of the host, we can do it. And we can get these done in a germ-free system. It's not perfect because when you lose a microbiome, you also change the development. It's slowed by two to three days. And then getting from pupil to adulthood, there's a significant reduction. So this just goes to show us that the microbiome is important in the development of these wasps, right? All right. So in the conventional state, we see uh, the two bars on the left are the homospecific or intraspecific crosses. The two bars in the middle are the interspecific crosses, and the number of hybrids that survive or not are shown. So uh, obviously when we did this in um, the germ-free state, we were quite pleased to see that the hybrids increased dramatically almost to a non-significant difference between the non-hybrids. So this was a surprising moment to us because the hybrids that technically die where the QTLs had been mapped, where the genetic basis had been started to work out, now were suddenly viable. And we could reinstate the mortality to a significant degree by putting in certain microbial species back into these particular hybrids. All right. So with these QTLs being mapped, we reason that something should change when these QTLs, uh, uh, something should change in the significance of these QTLs under the germ-free rearing conditions. Because if we rescue viability by rearing without the microbiome, we should also change whether these QTLs are significant in the cause of the mortality. We went ahead and assayed that just to, just to see if we were right. Uh, we took three QTL markers on different chromosomes. The expected frequency and the non-Mendelian frequency of these QTLs, that's what makes them QTLs, is that when you see a non-Mendelian ratio, certain genotypes are dying, certain genotypes are living, and we get these biases in the uh, allele frequencies away from Mendelian ratios. So chromosome one and two, we had a 75% bias towards the vitropenis allele. Chromosome four was a slight reduction, but somewhere close to Mendelian ratio. Uh, when we did this in our lab, we recapitulated these uh, marker ratio distortions in a non-Mendelian way, supporting their role as QTLs. But when you remove the microbiome and you remove the mortality, you restore these allele frequencies back to a Mendelian inheritance ratio. So the QTLs are contingent on the presence of the microbiome. The inviability is contingent on the presence of the microbiome. So you can't understand the origin of this entire reproductive isolation phenotype without putting the microbiome and the genome together in a complete story. All right, so we know genes are involved, we know microbes are involved. What is the relative importance of these? Um, so we did a full gene expression analysis. Uh, and in particular, we focused it on the immune genes. And dead hybrids, either in the conventional state or in the inoculated state, have a hyperexpressed immune system relative to the rest of the genome. Germ-free hybrids, when we remove the microbiome, remove the mortality, have a, uh, a significantly lower expressed immune set of genes relative to the rest of the genome. Now, this is done in the larval state just before mortality. Mortality occurs around the L2 stage. So we measured this as the precipitous to the mortality stage. What's happening just before they die? All right. So the germ-free uh, uh, immune system heat map is shown in this left here. The inoculated immune system and the conventional immune system expression are shown on the two to the right. You can see that the inoculated and conventional heat maps 
are more similar than to the germ-free as we would expect. Now this is allowing us to go deep into what genes might be the causative factors that interact with the microbiome to cause this mortality. So our current goal now is to actually flip the side back to genetics and ask, well, what are the host genes that are regulating the microbiome and that break down with the microbiome in hybrids? And what we've ended up with is a, a set of consistent candidates that are hyper-expressed in both the inoculated and in the conventional cases where we see mortality over the germ-free rearing. These SPs, if it hasn't come to you yet, are serine proteases. Now, serine proteases are really interesting because they sit at the top of the signaling cascade of the profanol oxidase immune pathway. And in insects, the profanol oxidase pathway drives melanization. So if you're affecting the serine proteases, you're also affecting the profanol oxidase. The profanol oxidase pathway drives melanization, and melanization is exactly the phenotype that we see associated with hybrid mortality. So I have a student now who's working in a lab, and it's pretty painstaking, but he's going to RNAi knock down these serine proteases or the profanol oxidase pathway to see if we can revert mortality just by knocking out the genes versus what we previously did where we just knocked out the microbiome. The position we have here is that it takes two to tango to drive the origin of species in this particular case. If you knock out the microbiome, you change the speciation event. If you knock out the genome, you also will change the speciation event. So we're going to try and prove both sides of this. And this ultimately gives us what we think of as a, as a whole genomic unit uh, or a whole genomic window into the origin of species for this particular system. So just to summarize, um, Nisonia has been an interesting case where we have F1 incompatibilities driven by Wolbachia. Imagine an ancestral population that's uninfected with Wolbachia. Wolbachia comes into two different populations. Those populations diverge, accumulate different Wolbachia infections, and ultimately cause F1 hybrid incompatibilities. This is essentially what we see in Nisonia between the younger and older species pair. Also, in the older species pair, we see other reproductive isolation traits that occur in the subsequent generations, the F2 generation, where we can link them back to the microbiome as well. So my question for, for you would be, have we just gotten lucky with Nisonia? Is it just that Nisonia is a great case for symbiosis and speciation? Or is it that we've asked the questions? And if other systems are, you, are studying this in the same way and they just ask the questions, will they find the similar sorts of things? I think the answer is, is yes, they will. And here's why. Um, there's already a, a, a rising amount of uh, either tangential or direct evidence for the role of uh, symbionts and speciation. So polystorum we've talked about. This is the Lee Ehrman case, the Wolfgang Miller work as well. John Janicki's work in recents and subquinaria. You know, melanogaster and simulants um, have been uh, obviously used to study the genetics of hybrid and viability, incompatibilities. One of the genes they found here is a nuclear pore complex gene that's linked to severe hybrid mortality between melanogaster and simulants. Nuclear pore complexes are the portals for which viruses actually go from the cytoplasm and enter into the nucleus. So perhaps there's some host microbe interaction that's driving the accelerated divergence of these nuclear pore genes that leads to their linkage to hybrid mortality. Right? It's unclear why that gene arose, but the fact that it has a host microbe interaction hasn't escaped me at least. Uh, aphid species, this is a bit more speculation, but clearly the origin of, of species that feed on nutri nutri nutrient deficient diets require symbionts. So the whole set of aphid species, the 4,000 aphid species on the planet, wouldn't exist without their symbionts. So the origin of them required the, spe required the symbiosis. And then I wonder whether the divergence of these species across different plant resources coincides with divergence in their symbionts, conferring them the ability to, to explore new resources as well. A more direct case in plants. So um, in 2007, Kirsten Bombley's published a paper where she found this hybrid necrosis phenotype within Arabidopsis, not between plants, but within Arabidopsis species. And she was able to link this hybrid necrosis, these small plants compared to the parents, to an immune gene that is essentially a classic defense gene. Uh, it's a nuclear binding um, leucine rich repeat gene. The fact that speciation biologists could map genes to immune genes uh, I think is relevant to the story of speciation by symbiosis because the immune gene is the window to the symbiosis. 
And if you're a geneticist and you find immune genes, you say you found a gene and you mapped it to the chromosomes, right? That, that quoted in the, earlier in the talk, that I know of very few cases where there's speciation by symbionts, but I know of many cases where they've been mapped to chromosomes. But the geneticist is only going to end up there, mapping the immune gene. The speciation microbiologist, if you will, will say, well, that immune gene is interacting with the microbes. There's a symbiosis component to that story. Um, even more speculative would be if you look at humans and many other animal systems, the immune system is the most rapidly evolving set of genes in the genome. It is under the most adaptive evolution, most positive selection. So this is the number of genes in the human genome under positive selection, and immunity and defense genes take the prize. Okay? So it just makes sense that the fast, most fastly evolving genes might have a higher role in driving hybrid incompatibilities in the origin of species. So. Uh, have we just ended up lucky with Nisonia in a few other cases? Probably not. It's just a matter of the culture of the fields and changing that culture, I think. All right, so we've gone from Darwin to sort of a historical outlay of, of, of this topic, um, from the foundation of evolutionary genetics to um, some of the key stories in the history of speciation by symbiosis. We've talked about speciation genes. We've now talked about speciation microbes. And ultimately, I think this comes together in, form, in a form of hologenomic speciation, where we really need a unified model where genetics and microbes comes together to think about the origin of species. And it's not good enough just to look at one side of the equation versus the other, because it leads to false conceptions about the relative importance of these processes. All right. The hologenome uh, holobiont theories are uh, a, a current topic of debate right now. And um, I, you know, I think everybody's uh, interested, but also everybody's a skeptic because it's sort of a new way of thinking about what is a unit of selection, what is a unit of evolution. Uh, Kevin Thies, who's at the University of Michigan, and I are trying to boil down some of the confusion over terminology and what all this stuff means. We're working on a paper right now called 10 Principles of the Hologenome. So the hologenome is ultimately uh, a controversial idea because it replaces the individual animal or plant as the primary unit of evolution. This is what the Rosenbergs advocate for in their 2013 book on the whole genome concept, but also in their papers since 2007 advocating this idea. Um, actually, Richard Jefferson, uh, who's not in science anymore, used to be, uh, has a video on YouTube from 1994 where he was giving a lecture on PCR. And he had this sort of insight that PCR was going to allow us to look at the total genetics of the organism, to look at all the microbes associated with all of the genes in the genome, and he called this the hologenome. Um, so he never published anything, but he actually has an independent derivation and introduction of the word. So it's worth bringing him into the conversation here. Anyways, these are kind of what we're thinking about. Um, could be food for thought for later if we want to discuss this. So the hologenome is the whole genetics. The holobiont is comprised not just of mutualists, but parasites and commensalists. And there's no intellectual problem here. Parasites are just like selfish genetic elements in the genome. We have parasitic genes, we have parasitic microbes. There's no problem in thinking about these things as part of the evolutionary unit. Uh, the whole genome unifies genes and microbes. And what I mean by that is that if you think of a microbe, like a nuclear gene in the genome, you find that there's really no intellectual disparity between these two ways of thinking about evolution. That is, if a gene is positively se selected, a microbe can be positively selected. If a gene evolves under neutral evolution, a microbe can evolve neutrally as well. All right? And the more you take that kind of thinking, whether you're on one side of the debate or the other, I think the more you find whether this theory is, is, uh, is valid or not, or at least holds water. Um, you know, the whole genome is mutable, heritable, subject to selection and or, and or neutral evolution. It's mutable in many forms, right? We're not just talking about the nuclear genome. We're talking about the microbiome being mutable. We're talking about horizontal gene transfer. We're talking about microbial amplification. These are all sources of variation in the whole of the genome. Some of it may be heritable by vertical transmission. Some of it may be acquired by, uh, environmentally. One thing that I try and caution people on is that the whole genome does not change evolution. So it is provocative whenever a new term or idea comes along to say, does this change the way we think about evolution? And the answer is no. It simply upgrades evolution to think about the total symbiosis involved in an animal or a plant. Um, and I think it's this kind of thinking that, or at least expression, that might 
make uh, those who are skeptical sort of less skeptical, at least curious about the idea. This fits squarely into multi-level selection theory. So if you start at selfish DNA and you work up to genes on a chromosome and you work up to chromosomes and you work up to genomes, to communities, to groups, to species, I mean, the, mul the multi-level selection theory really applies here. There's nothing abnormal about thinking about the animal and its symbionts as part of this continuum of multiple levels of selection. Okay, terminology. Superorganism organ are frequently used when people talk about the microbiome. I don't like these words. Okay, superorganism is meant to mean one species many individuals, like a colony of ants. One organism, many, many individuals. Whereas the hologenome is an assembly of many organisms into a larger unit, right? This is a fundamental difference here. Superorganism really falls squarely into the eusocial thinking. Whereas I think we prescribe this term because for unclear reasons, you know, maybe super means we're more than just one organism to some people, but it really has a historical different meaning. And I think we shouldn't use the word superorganism to not confuse those origins. Um, organ, yeah, so that's a fun term, but an organ is a population of cells in one organism that comprise that organ. And the microbiome is a population of many different cells, an extreme diversity of cells that may have many different functions. I don't think the organ analogy applies. It's, it's one genome. One set, of, one set of cells, essentially. The microbiome is many different genomes, many types of cells. The metagenome, I don't have as big of a uh, sort of gripe with, but the term meta from Greek means above or beyond, right? So it's almost like you're moving the, the things that might comprise the whole individual above or beyond away from the particular individual. Whereas holos in Greek means whole or part of one. And the hologenome nicely parallels the term holobiont. So I find those terms to be most consistent with what we're trying to talk about in this area, ones that I stick to, although they're debatable. Um, the hologenome reboots elements of Lamarckian evolution, right? If we have a large role of environmental acquisition, clearly we're talking about things becoming integrated into the organism from the environment and it blends genetic and microbial causes of speciation. Okay, so we're writing this now. If anybody wants to look at it, we'd appreciate feedback, just let me know. Um, and let me just say thank you to uh, Rob Brucker, who did the majority of this work, at least some of the recent work. Uh, he's a junior fellow now at the Roland Institute at Harvard University, um, starting up his, uh, his lab there. Um, Lisa Funkhauser, Teddy, Von Opstel, Andrew Books, uh, we're all PhD students involved in this work. Rini Polly uh, is a bioinformatician and some rotation students that contributed along the way. All right, so thanks for listening. I uh, appreciate it and take any questions if there are any. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, so are you thinking about animals or plants that have asexual reproduction? Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay, so bacteria is a huge mess, huge can of worms. Uh, I don't think there's anything that really works for species concepts and bacteria, uh, clonal organisms, larger clonal. So I tend to stay away from that. The operational definition for the biological species concept really works best in the sexual reproduction world. And the foundation of contemporary speciation biology is focused on that. I will say that asexual organisms, you know, there's some room there for potentially thinking about the biological species concept because at some point an asexual organism is derived from a sexual organism. And at some point, the sexual organism no longer mates with the asexual organism. So the origin of that event, there is, a, there is relevance to the biological species concept there. Just because something becomes, um, has the capacity to be asexual, doesn't mean that it won't be sexual. So in that early event, I think that it's possible to study the biological species concept. But once they're fully asexual, it's, a, it's just a different realm of thinking about what species.
how to study it operationally. So the biological species concept is useful because it's an operational definition. It equates speciation with the evolution of reproductive isolation. So I'm kind of avoiding the question, but that's what we do in this field, I guess. <laughs> Sure. Well, I, uh, certainly group selection would fall into multiple level selection theory. And, uh, you know, if we're avoiding the term group because it causes some in inflammatory reactions, so be it. Um, but I actually, I mean, I think multi-level selection theory, which is what the Rosenbergs argue as well, is exactly what it is. Um, that there's a continuum of units of selection. I love to think about the whole genome being the opposite end of selfish DNA. So selfish DNA is the minimal unit of selection of it within an individual's genome. Um, that can comprise a unit of selection and suffered its own controversy as, as Ford well knows about whether it can be a unit of selection and so forth. I think the whole genome is the opposite end of that. Um, and I'd rather look at it as a continuum rather than as, ah, this is group selection versus not. Group selection is a little different too. Group selection is individuals of the same species forming a group and the whole genome is multiple species forming a group. Oh. What do I mean by that? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, take the example of the Drosophila that were reared on different media. So they immediately acquire different gut microbes, and those gut microbes persist. So nothing changed in their nuclear genome, but they did change their microbiome by environmental acquisition of these new microbes. Um, there's a couple things there. Uh, let me take the epigenetics one. So I, a lot of people are trying to link the microbiome and epigenetics. Personally, I think the microbiome goes much farther than epigenetics does, because epigenetics is encoded by the genome to affect something transgenerationally above the genome, whereas the microbiome is its own genome itself. They have their own genomes. I think these are conceptually very different and more, more powerful for the microbiome, actually, than epigenetics. Yeah. Um. That's why I was going to answer your question with that, which is, you know, we, we know the pattern, and the pattern is, is, is interesting, right? It's not exactly what we have as a null hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So what explains the pattern then is up to sort of laboratory experiments to figure out. Um, but when we're doing this under a controlled environment, 
there's clearly some kind of post by microbe genetic interaction happening there. The specificity of that are, are for us to work out. I agree. Well, that's the last question. I just want to endorse your separating the word whole genome from the metagenome, because it seems to me the whole genome concept implies some kind of organismality of the collective. Exactly. Whereas if we swept this floor in here and sequenced it, that would be a metagenome. Exactly. This floor, that we wouldn't find this floor. Yes. And in fact, the origin of metagenome what from was soil microbes, you know, is yeah. Handelsman's use of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, so what I, yeah, what I'd like to propose is that we just, uh, during the transition here, people do need to use the washroom or what have you. Everybody go to the washroom. Well, yeah. <laughs> we do have a, a minute or two where we swap computers, so there'll be a, two minutes of downtime, and then we'll come back here and we'll roughly stay. All right.